Take your Bibles and let's turn, please, to Matthew chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four. And I remind you that we're in the process of introducing the gospel of Matthew, which extends from chapter one, verse one through 411. And in today's uh, lesson, we expect to complete this introduction to Matthew. In, in our study this morning, we'll be considering the third temptation of Christ. We've already seen that temptation is normal <clears throat> and is to be expected. The temptation is not sin, that sin occurs whenever we give in to temptation. We have seen that temptations are often subtle, but sometimes they are direct. We've seen that if we would avoid the sin, we should do our best to avoid the temptation. Now, sometimes it is God's will that we are tempted. We are to pray, lead us not into temptation. But sometimes that's not God's will. That is an exhortation made to God. It's an entreaty. We're entreating him not to lead us into temptation. But we are entreating him instead to deliver us from the evil, whether it's the evil thing or the evil one. It's not clear. It could be both. The problem is, Sometimes we expose ourselves to temptation. And it's not God's fault that we're tempted. We open the door ourselves, whether it's by being places we should not be, by looking at things we should not look at, by listening to things we should not listen to, or whatever. And we need to be very careful that we do what we can to avoid temptation. I've told the story before we had a lady in our church in Illinois who was an alcoholic and she supposedly was uh, cleaned up on the alcoholism for a while. And while she was, she got herself a new job, cleaning tables in a, the local bar. And of course, it didn't take long um, there were some contents still there. She had a few and she's right back into where she started from. You, you, you just cannot fool around with temptation and expect not to get burned. Victory is achieved by a proper application of the scripture and reliance upon the Holy Spirit. But if we're ever going to be able to use the scriptures in our lives, we have to expose ourselves to its study on a regular basis. And I don't mean Christmas and Easter. I mean by that, that we need to do serious Bible study every day of our lives as God enables us, as well as to be faithful in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching local church. Not one of these that groups that's playing church, and not one of these that never gets beyond John 3.16, but like this one where the Word of God, the whole counsel of God is faithfully and accurately taught, and where we are paying attention to what it is saying. Satan's temptations often come immediately after some high point spiritually in our lives. As human beings, however, with old sin natures, and we all have one of those, we find sin pleasurable. When we are tempted, we often fall because in our old sin natures, we want to sin. But as I've said, we don't need temptation from without in order to commit sin. Our old sin natures are enough to cause a problem for us, even if there were no devil. This is going to be made abundantly clear during the millennium when Satan is going to be chained 
and therefore inoperable or unable to operate as he has been for a period of a thousand years and people will still commit sin. We've already seen several things regarding the temptation of Christ. It was real, even though he was not able to sin because of his divine nature. It was brought upon Jesus by the direct will of God the Father. In other words, he was right where he was supposed to be and experiencing exactly what he was supposed to be experiencing. It was not a test on God's part to see if Christ would commit sin. Rather, it was a demonstration on God's part to show that Jesus would not commit sin and that he was qualified to be our sin bearer. Amen. Satan's object in the threefold temptation of Christ was to induce Christ to act on his own thus independently of his father. The first two temptations were subtle. You and I might have missed them were it not for Christ's answer to them. The third one wasn't subtle, it was direct. In the temptation, Satan pointed out ways of Jesus carrying out his ministry, which would have avoided the cross but he was defeated by the intelligent use of the word of God. Now, we've looked at the things that were leading up to the temptation, temptations in verses one and two. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. It wasn't just a test from Satan's standpoint, it was a temptation. He was trying to elicit sin on Jesus' part. On God's part, it was a test to show that Christ wasn't going to. But Satan gave it his best shot. And of course, he failed. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. As I've already said, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Thus, it demonstrates that he was in the perfect will of God when he was tempted. Amen. You might experience something similar, being in the perfect will of God for your life and yet being tempted. Luke's gospel indicates that Jesus was not only tempted with these three temptations after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, but that he was actually tempted throughout the 40 day period. We've also noted the first temptation, which was turn these stones into bread. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, don't be confused by this phrase, if thou be the son of God. It does not question whether Jesus is the son of God. The structure of, the, of this condition in the Greek text indicates that it is assumed by Satan for the sake of discussion to be true. And it is understood because it is true. It is understood in the sense of because or since or in as much as or as in view of the fact that you are the son of God. Satan knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus was God, the son, the Messiah. And then he says, command that these stones be made bread. Well, why did he say that? Well, in effect, Satan was saying, do something for yourself. You're hungry. You've been hungry long enough. You have the right and power to satisfy your own appetite. You can do this because you are the son of God. 
The implication is that you, Jesus, are a physical being with physical appetites which need to be satisfied. And this thinking would eventually lead to the conclusion that man lives by bread alone. It was an attempt to pervert Jesus Christ from perfect obedience to the will of God. He was in the desert in the will of God. He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the will of God. All that he endured in the desert was part of God's will for him. And it was God's will for him to be hungry at this time. For Jesus to satisfy his own desires would have been for him to abandon the will of God and substitute his own will, deeming the satisfaction of his appetite more important than his obedience to the will of God the Father. Jesus then was tempted a second time. The temptation is cast yourself down and it's found in verses 5 through 7. We don't know why, but for some reason, Luke in his gospel reverses the order of the second and third temptations. We saw this temptation. Verse 5, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and setteth him on a pinnacle, meaning on the highest point of the temple. And Satan saith unto him, meaning to Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Well, in verse 6, Satan obviously tempts Jesus to throw himself down, thereby making a dramatic display or entrance. The angels are pictured as rescuing him in Satan's words. But he misquotes Psalm 91, 11 through 12 to make his case. I've said it previously, Satan is good at misquoting or misapplying the scripture. It is important that you do diligent study to know what the scriptures say and what they mean. They mean what they say. They say what they mean. But there's a lot of people out there that seem to be quoting scripture that's not a biblical way to quote it. And saith unto him, Satan says to Jesus once again, if thou be the son of God, does not question whether Jesus is the son of God. I will repeat what I said earlier for your benefit. Its structure in English might lead you to that conclusion. But its structure in the Greek text indicates that for sake of discussion, it is assumed to be true by Satan who said it. It's understood, therefore, because it is true, it's understood in the sense of because, since, inasmuch as, or in view of the fact that you are the Son of God. It's based on his being the Son of God. Cast thyself down. Throw yourself down. Satan misquoted Psalm 91, 11 and 12. He left out a phrase. He conveniently left out to keep thee in all thy ways which limits when God's angels would keep Christ. Amen. It was in doing God's will, not in presuming on God. Amen. For Jesus to cast himself down from the highest point of the temple was not God's will for him. It would be putting God to the test. Sometimes believers also put God to the test. They see how far they can go straying toward the world without God stopping them. They seem to try, well, what, I, what they can get away with. It's wrong to do that. 
The implication of this temptation was that Satan was encouraging Jesus to make a grand and spectacular entrance to the people from off the highest point of the temple. I really don't know how high that was, and nobody else does either, but the thought is that there are two places or one place where it could have been as high as, and I've seen the estimates anywhere from 450 to 600 feet high. Well, can you imagine what would happen to you if you took a nosedive 450 to 600 feet down onto rocks? Well, you might get a lump or two on your noggin. You would deserve it if you jumped off of that. Jesus, he's saying, he, you're not going to hit bottom. His angels will come along and carry you so that you won't even stub your toe. The implication, such a descent by the Messiah into the midst of worshipers would supposedly have led to their immediate acclaim of him who made such a spectacular descent. It must be the Messiah. Satan's implication was that Jesus as a son had a right to put his father to a test. He did not have that right, and neither do you or I. However, for Jesus to put God the Father to a test would be for him to abandon his dependence on God the Father. You know, there are people that presume upon God. They don't want to get saved now. They want to sow their wild oats or they want to live for the devil for a while. And then later in life, make a decision to trust Christ as Savior after they've had lots and lots of fun. The problem with that is that later in life may never come. And often it doesn't. Any promise in the word of God may be claimed when the person claiming it is in the will of God. But when you step outside of the will of God, you really cannot expect God to fulfill what he's promised, at least necessarily. For Christ to act in obedience to Satan would have removed him from the protection of this promise made by God. And he was not about to do that. We saw his answer in verse 7. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It means we should not be putting the Lord our God to the test to see how far we can go. We need to be careful about that because there are places where we sometimes do things just to see what's going to happen. We move on today to the third temptation. All these things will I give thee. The temptation itself is found in verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The other two temptations were subtle. There's nothing subtle about this one. The devil, of course, is Satan. Taketh him up means takes him with or takes him along, takes Jesus along into an exceeding high mountain, into a very high mountain, wherever we don't know. And it doesn't make any difference. And showeth him is and shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them, all the magnificence 
or splendor of all of these kingdoms. I'm not sure what what country you'd want to see about being all the magnificence or splendor with all the sin that goes on in the world. But anyway, that's what it says. And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You know, usually that, that's a conditional statement. Usually when you have a conditional statement, you put the condition first and then the conclusion second so that this would read, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you all these things. But when you want to get your son's attention, for example, you don't put the if part first. Do this if you know what's good for you. You, you understand how that works? Sure you do. All of us have done that once or twice or had it done to us. You know, and if the mother or father mentions that middle name, you know you're in trouble. All right. <laughs> well, Jesus had Satan emphasizing the conclusion by placing it first rather than the condition. All these things refers to all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them. Will I give thee as I will give these to you, Jesus? I, Satan, make this commitment to you. Hmm. Can you trust what a liar says? How do we know that Satan actually would have done this even though he had power to do it? I never, I, I've done a lot of research in a bunch of commentaries. I've been writing something on this section and I can't find anybody that would question whether Satan might have been lying. But I question it. Why would he tell the truth then? After Jesus did what he wanted, why would he need to? Because he would have been disqualified as our sin bearer at that point. But let's just go on with the text and not get too sidetracked with whether Satan was telling the truth or lying. Did he have this authority to give these things to Jesus? And the answer is yes, he did. A couple of verses. You might want to turn to this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. We have used this on a num number of occasions. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It says, starting in verse number 3, But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost. What it amounts to is that the unsaved crowd cannot on their own comprehend the gospel message. They have to have God the Holy Spirit opening their understanding of it. Which means that you really can't talk somebody into it. If God is not convicting him, you can twist his arm and pull his leg and try to give him all the stories and all that you want. But he's not going to get saved apart from God, the Holy Spirit, opening his understanding of it. Notice as we go on, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom? The God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. They are spiritually blind. And therefore in their minds they cannot perceive the truth of the gospel apart from God's opening their understanding of it. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What it amounts to is this. Satan does his dead level best 
to hinder people from coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. And it's a supernatural work of God the Holy Spirit who enables people to understand. And we need to pray that God will open their understanding so that they'll trust Christ as Savior. Amen. And sometimes those people have had it open. You know, there, there's a certain amount of light, but if they have rejected the light they have, that light gets less and less and less and less. You'll reach people through spiritual means. You, you, you know, it's not an intellectual thing. It's not, uh, uh, it's not something you can tease somebody into. It's something that you need to be sure you've been praying for them and that God does a work in their lives. Amen. They will understand it when he does. According to John 12, 31, Satan is also the prince of this world. Now is a judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. That's Satan. Amen. So all the kingdoms of the world were his to give. Furthermore, it is God's will that Jesus will eventually rule the entire creation. But this won't take place until the millennium and then it will take place throughout the millennium following the second coming of Christ. Satan is promising to give these kingdoms to Jesus now at the time of the temptation with the result that Jesus will not have to wait to rule over them. You know how you deal with your children. You can have it now or later. What are they going to choose? Now, yeah, and if you don't give it to me now, I'm going to scream my head off. You do and you'll wish you hadn't. Okay, you can't put up with that stuff. Or you'll be listening to far worse when they want a car or a motorcycle when they're 16. He can have them now rather than waiting on God the Father to give them to him. Why would anyone believe anything a known liar says. But let's assume he was not going to lie. He was telling the truth to Jesus for once. Of course, for Jesus, as well as for us, part of God's will is God's timing. Now consider, I can't speak of your experiences a whole lot. Most of you can't remember this experience, but my guess is that everyone here was born on the day of God's choosing. So that you are exactly the right age right now. So son, just in case you were wondering, I'm not too old. I'm just right, right where God wants me to be. And you're not too young. But there was a time when you were too young to pastor a church. I mean, when you're in grade school, you really weren't ready. Times have changed and you have become ready, but it was in God's timing. God's timing is always right. And it will be God's will for Jesus to rule the world during the millennium. But this was not God's will at that time. The condition for this was if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And of course, it was totally unacceptable to Jesus. He could not fall down and worship him. The creator could not fall down and worship a created being. This was contrary to God's will for Jesus. It was contrary to his divine nature and it would be wrong for us to do so as well. Amen. God's will is to bring the son to a throne, but it's by way of the cross. The devil was implying that Jesus might get what the father has promised without going to the cross. Only one condition 
if you will bow down and worship me. This was not very subtle. To receive worship has always been Satan's chief ambition since he fell. Being motivated, motivated by pride, he attempted to dethrone God, to usurp God's authority, and to receive the worship, honor, and glory that belongs to God himself. Isaiah 12, I mean, make that 14, 12 through 14, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, but it goes beyond Nebuchadnezzar to Satan himself. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Of course, he's a total failure when it comes to these things. But that was something he thought he could do. We see Christ's answer in verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Get thee hence, go away, Satan, be gone, Satan. It has been written, and it remains written. What has been written and is still written is thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. Quoted from Deuteronomy 6.13 as well as Deuteronomy 10.20. Absolutely nothing should be more important in our lives than the Lord. We have to be careful to remember that Anything we deem more important than the Lord is actually an idol to us. That could be family. That could be a car. That could be a home. That could be a job. That could be money. That could be sports. I ought to preach this on Super Bowl Sunday so that the people come to church that night, do you think? Amazing. Churches, Bible-believing churches cancel their services on Sunday of Super Bowl week. You want to watch the Super Bowl? Watch it, but record it and come to church first. The events following the temptation are seen in verse number 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. I don't remember which other gospel is, it is in. It's either Mark or Luke says he left him for a time. It means he was going to come back again at a more opportune time. The devil left him. The Bible gives us the promise, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you in James 4, 7. Amen. We see that angels came and ministered to him. It had been a long time since he was there. Angels are his servants. Realize the temptation is normal and to be expected. The question remains, how are you going to handle it? Well, I recommend that you do your best to avoid putting yourself in a situation where you know you're going to be tempted because you realize that you might fall into sin. You know, it's been a long time since I was a teenager, but I remember how people used to say, uh, I don't need, I don't need to follow those rules. I can take care of myself. I can manage, I can handle it. Thinking, yeah, I can handle it. Be careful 
Just be careful. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're liable to be tempted. I can do this. I can do that. Yeah, right. We all know. We've all been places where we've tried that approach and suffered the consequences. When tempted by Satan, resist by appealing to Scripture like Jesus did. As I've said, to do this, you're going to have to know what the Bible says. Derive comfort from the fact that we have a high priest who, having been tempted himself, is able to aid the rest of us in our temptations. By not giving heed to the devil, Jesus will actually receive the very blessings which Satan offered him, but it's in a far more glorious sense and with God the Father's favor resting upon him. He, he, he receives strength to endure physically. He receives the ministry of the angels. And he will receive authority over the kingdoms of the world. Well, it's time for us to pray and...